Welcome to the AgriHive Business Summit Series, presented in partnership with Centacare CQ as part of the Australian Government Drought Assistance Package. We hope Graham Greenhalgh will give some real insights to make tactical and strategic decisions for your business. The value is in planning around this information. Share this video and join a new wave of resilient businesses as they grow with www.agrihive.com. Have a great day. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, I've got, um, actually I've got a bit showing up tonight because James said, uh, do you want the projector for your presentation? And um, Typically we don't talk a lot about our business to anybody because it's, uh, it's not something that um, is overly interesting to many people. It's, uh, it's, it, it's fascinating to us but I think it's probably applicable to, uh, to a lot of people here and uh, what we do and how we do it. Um, and you know we run our business on a, uh, we've got the next five years planned out and it's all on an A4 piece of paper. So it's, uh, it's pretty simple, it's pretty direct. And um, as a result, I don't have a uh, presentation for you. But I have got a, uh, well, a couple of things which uh, struck me out of today. And um, uh, one in particular was in April, I went to uh, New Zealand to look at abattoirs and the meat industry in New Zealand. And I just came back humiliated. It was uh, embarrassing to think that uh, Australia thinks it's at the races compared to what New Zealand's doing with food. Uh, they are unbelievable and uh, it was pretty inspirational. I then went to the uh, footy last Saturday night in Sydney and that was bloody humiliating. <laughs> so uh, that was very disappointing. And then I got to stand up here after the uh, presentation we just had about what New Zealand's doing with its youth and what they're doing with agriculture and uh, uh, I've got to say that's a bit humiliating because it's, um, and, and I think uh, not wanting to be a downer on the night, but if we look at it and say uh, uh, in life there are things that we can do to make a difference and there are things in that that sometimes make a difference for good and sometimes make a difference that take us backwards and I think that, uh, you know, probably there's a lot of us today was talking about a lot of things which have been dragging us backwards and, and pulling us down and I think it's, I think it's really important that we uh, you know we kind of bust off those shackles and we, uh, we look at what's good and we look at what we can do that's, that's good that's going to make a difference for us because we've got a pretty exciting industry. We heard what Tim said about the, uh, the future that's in front of us and I think um, you know certainly uh, there's a lot of reason to be pretty excited about the future of agriculture. So I guess if I can just um, read my speech because I'm not used to uh, public speaking. But uh, I guess I want to thank James for what he's done, what he's put together here. It's, a, uh, it's an impressive turnout. Uh, I'm, I'm a boy from southern New South Wales, grew up on the uh, western edge of the, uh, uh, the mountains in the headwaters of the uh, Murray. We've got green grass and fat cattle and not much country and um, it's uh, this is my first time to Longreach, so I've uh, I've learned a lot today. Um, I've learned that uh, when it doesn't rain, it probably doesn't really matter what you do. It's bloody tough, and I'm not really sure. Um, you know, I uh, I got to say, you know, the presentation on the uh, imaginary farmer and and how you would uh, work through that. When I left school, I went to uh, went Jack Rewing and worked at a place at Coombe. It was owned by the Litchfield family, who were uh, impressive pastoralists in southern Australia and they'd just come out of, the, it was in 1983 and they were just coming out of a five year drought and so for the first six months I fed corn six days a week, 14 hours a day, loaded trucks, fed sheep, loaded trucks, fed sheep, loaded trucks, fed sheep and I was uh, destroyed by it and I uh, was working one day in the yards with Mr Litchfield and I said to him, uh, you know, it's pretty tough, how are you going? He said, uh, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you've had five years of drought. It's just a desert. How are you, how are you coping? 
And he said, yeah, it's, uh, it's very challenging. And I said, um, you know, how do you just keep fronting up every day? How do, you, how do you do this? And he said, it's what I've chosen. And uh, I don't expect anybody to feel sorry for me. And I'm just going to keep doing it because that's what I do. And then I remember about, uh, it was just on Easter, it rained and uh, they had about six foot of grass before you could blink. And um, I was talking to him one day and I said, look, you know, what would you do differently next time you're faced with a drought? He said, look, it's always been our policy to uh, keep six years running expenses in the bank. So I think next time I might build it up to eight. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my dad was a butcher and a farmer and uh, I used to go home on weekends every now and then when we got a day off after it had rained and drove the three, hour, three hours back to mum and dad and dad said to me, you know, how's it going? What have you learned? Because he, he was always interested. You know, these guys were good guys. So I was up there sponging everything I could. And he said, what have you learned? I said, Dad, I've got a gem. He said, what is it? I said, you know, you go out and you cut silage and you put hay away and you do all that. Bloody waste of time. He said, is that right? What should I do? I said, well, I've worked it out. You just put eight years running expenses in the bank. <laughs> At which point I got invited to leave. So uh, as a result of that, I went to Sydney, uh, got involved with a meat trading business. Uh, you know, I guess uh, agriculture was probably a little bit too tough for me. So when we look at it and we say, what do, what do people in those situations do? Some of us just run away. Um, and I, uh, that's what I did. I uh, went to Sydney, got involved in meat trading. I enjoyed the uh, excitement that it, uh, that it connected me back to the land. It was a product that I could understand. My, father and my grandfather's were butchers and uh, uh, there was something about meat that that held my interest so uh, I went there and um, you know learned how to buy and sell how to how to, uh, uh, how to extract value out of things how to look at things differently and see opportunities and uh, uh, you know, there were always challenges. The dollar was up, this market was closed, that market was closed, there were chemicals in meat, meat was banned here, it was banned there. You know, and we just seemed to face every problem that could ever come along, but uh, what you realised was that there was always a solution and there was something different that you could do and there was something that you could uh, change and, and you could um, influence your outcome. And so I think I'd probably say that's what I've, what I've learnt today coming into country like this, that it's pretty foreign to me, but uh, you know we've got a business that buys uh, a lot of cattle out of country like this, and I hear the stories from Gawley about how tough it is and, and how hard people are doing it, and you come out here and you see it, but what you realise is people are resourceful, and people have just got uh, the ability to battle through anything and, uh, and prosper. So I guess, um, you know, if I, could, if I could go on from that bit to... Uh, my presentation, which uh, there's a couple of things that um, I think are really important, uh, well probably one of them if I can go back a sec, because uh, when James asked me to talk about the value chain, I thought, shit, what's a value chain? don't even know what a value chain is. So I did what all smart people do, I went to uh, Wikipedia, <laughs> and I hope this is right. And it said, what's a, what's a value chain? A value chain is a chain of activities that a firm operating in a specific industry performs in order to deliver a valuable product or service to the market. And it goes on to say the concept comes from a business management uh, dude who was called Michael Potter in 1985 who wrote a book. And it was called Competitive Advantage and Creating a Sustaining Superior Performance. And I thought... I really like that, sustaining superior performance. But I also thought, gee, that's pretty interesting, actually. James hit, a, hit the nail on the head. We actually have got a value chain. And uh, in our business, we, uh, we buy and process uh, natural and organic cattle and sheep. Uh, we're also just getting involved in some, uh, some pigs now. But um, so we do have a value chain and we do have a lot of people who participate in that value chain. So I guess what I want to tell, about, uh, tell you guys is give you some ideas about what we did to first of all create one and then how we, uh, how we penetrate it and how I think that 
you know, farmers in general can, can look to penetrate it and what it means. So I guess before I go into too much of it, what I really want to probably say is that uh, there's a couple of really basic fundamentals I think are really important that everybody keeps in their mind. And they're that um, in Australia we produce about three times the amount of beef... Jeez, doesn't like this. There's about... Uh, we produce about three times the amount of beef that we need to eat in this country and the rest of it's exported. I heard today that we... Uh, need about 10% of the wool we produce and we sell the rest of that. I looked up some statistics, give or take. Australia supplies about 4% of the world's beef. And when we go into just calling it meat, which is ultimately what we compete with, we compete with everything. It's not just the guy down the road who's got a cow, we compete with the people who've got a chicken or a pig or a fish or whatever it is. Well, no, not fish, that's not in the numbers. but. Australian beef makes up about 0.75% of the world's meat production. So, the bottom line is, we really only matter to about 1% of meat consumers in the world. So I guess, you know, on one side of that you could say we're not very significant. But the fact is that to those 1% of the people in the world who eat our meat or use our meat, we're absolutely paramount to how they run their businesses and their success. So from uh, what could sound like uh, not much of an opportunity, I'd probably turn it the other way and say I think it's a phenomenal opportunity. We're incredibly important to a very small amount of people. But I guess you know, what we heard today was a whole bunch of things, you know, they talked about what's going on in the market, what's happening with the weather, what's happening with the tax man, what's happening with the this and the that, and everything which was all absolutely out of your space of control. And they're, and they're basically things that are going to influence your business, and I'm not really sure how you, uh, what you do to change those. But, um, I think, you know, the, talking about a value chain, and uh, I'd, I'd say there's probably three key things you've got to establish or you've got to think about when you're talking about a value chain and how you penetrate it. First of all, someone's got to make one. You've got to create a value chain. They don't just, you know, they're not just running around out there and you're going, you know, round one up. So someone's got to create it. And then once someone's got to create it, uh, you know, we've got to identify where we fit into that chain and then how we're going to be relevant to that chain. And I think that's a big word that's pretty important and that's relevant. And what's your relevance, what's our relevance, and, and how are you going to be relevant to that value chain? Because it uh, comes back to how you're going to participate in it. So then I guess once we've got that, the third thing we've got to do, we've got to understand and we've got to identify what actions we've got to take so that we can participate in that. Because I think that's the other thing that we've got to remember. In all of these things, you've got to actually do something. There's got to be an action. And so they're probably the three things that uh, I guess I want to base my talk around. So at the end of it, you go, uh, how do you create one? Well, I'll, I'll share you a story of how uh, Arcadian created its value chain, and that was uh, our CEO, Alistair Ferguson, who's in the US seeing customers and uh, uh, building on his value chain. He came to me about eight years ago and uh, said to me, Graham, uh, he'd been trading meat for us and been looking after Indonesia and Korea and a bit of the domestic market everywhere, learning all his skills. He came to me and he said, uh, I want to start killing organic cattle. Jesus. I said, yeah, all right. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? He said, I want to start killing 66 cattle a fortnight. And I thought, Nah, it can't be that hard. Australia kills well over 100,000 cattle every week. That's not much. We should be able to handle that. Well, I thought I'll just quiz him a bit more. I said, so what are you going to pay this bloke? He goes, uh, not really sure. I'm going to pay him a premium. I went, right. Where's this bloke? He goes, a bloke at Blackhall. I know him. I'll, uh, I said, hey, how long are you going to buy the cattle for? He said, I'm going to buy them for the next 12 months. You know, we lived in a world where we bought something today to ship tomorrow to get paid the next day. And this guy's coming into me saying, I'm going to go and pay this bloke a premium and I'm going to lock him up 12 months in advance. I said, yep, that's good, mate. So I said, how many customers you got? He goes, I got one bloke. 
what do you know with one leg? He goes, I've got a bloke in Canada, he's going to make lasagnas, going to make organic lasagnas. I said, say, you know, Ferg, you're telling me you're going to build a business out of one bloke who's got 66 cattle a fortnight and some bloke in Canada who wants to make organic lasagnas. He goes, yep. I said, Jesus, mate, you're really pushing it. And he said, look, just, just let me do it. I know I can do it. You know, it just makes sense. It's got to work. He just said, just, just give me a go. I'll prove to you that I can do it. And so, uh, you know, at the end of it, that's how we created, that's how Al created the value chain that he's, uh, that he's put together. So then, uh, I guess, you know, the next bit of it was, uh, where did we fit into that value chain? What, you know, where was our place? What was our relevance? So, you know, back then it wasn't this, but now Australia will probably kill 60, 70,000 organic cattle every year which when you put that into the context of the previous numbers I talked about, you know, we've just become an absolute minnow. We're, we're a third of a decimal point of uh, relevance in the world. And so I guess going back to the other point about that, what we became was unbelievably specific. But in the process of that, we became unbelievably important to our customers. So whoever the people were around the world who were eating that meat, they probably didn't have too many alternatives and we became unbelievably important to what they had and what they needed. So, you know, I guess what we learnt from that was we might have only been little at the beginning, but we were uh, incredibly important to a couple of people. So then I guess the, uh, the next bit comes back to you've got to work out, uh, you know, we needed to identify what we had to do, what actions we had to take to participate in that chain. So from our point of view, um, you know, we, we, we looked at the whole situation and we looked at where that gap was, which is what we always look for. That's what we're trained to do, is to, to find that gap, because that's your opportunity. So we went out there and we looked and we said, right, man, there's a global population out here in some of the mature markets, there's six, seven percent of consumption's inorganic. We've got this tiny little micro percentage of a product. You know what? That's probably the gap. That's what we're going to pursue. Then we went out there and we, uh, we'd identified the gap, then we learnt what we had to do to fill that gap. And uh, it wasn't just what we were doing at the time, we had to change. You know, all of a sudden, all the, all the channels we sell, sold through, all the, all the people we did business with, they weren't relevant to this, they didn't, they didn't fit in that space. So we needed to understand what the new set of skills were, we needed to build them. You know, we went from buying meat, putting it on a ship or a plane and sending it across the world, to all of a sudden having to buy a cow and or buy a beast and get it processed and get it put into boxes of meat and ship it around the world and clear it and get wholesalers to distribute it and put it on a supermarket shelf and make it into a sausage or a burger or whatever. So what we did was we adapted in order to be able to hit that gap, hit that market. And then through that, you know, we obviously came up with a lot of vulnerabilities and, you know, you'd achieve this this week and then next week you let yourself down. And, and, and so what we learnt was we had to be incredibly reliable. If we were going to be that important to someone, we also had to be reliable. We had to be there seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. And if we weren't, we didn't get to come back. So, you know, we spent a lot of time building our skills about how the fact we actually gave the customer what they wanted. You know, and in a way, that was probably the easy bit. And then the really hard bit was we had to keep paying those suppliers more and the customers kept demanding more and there wasn't enough. And so we were faced with probably a space we'd never been faced before and that was we didn't really have unlimited supply. We did have a finite amount of product, so we had to start using a whole new set of skills to build supply to be able to feed demand, to be able to, you know, I guess, create and evolve a business that went from something very small to something that became a little bit more substantial. And I think the other thing that was, uh, that was probably the bit we did in that that made a difference, and, and I think, you know, uh, they're all the bits that, that everybody here all of those things, I think, will have applicability to what you guys do. Uh, the other thing we did 
was we went to our customers and we said, you know, what do you need us to do? What, what have we got to do that's better? What are we doing that's wrong? What do you need? How have we got to change? What is it your customer wants? What have we got to be that makes us the person you're going to ring? What, what's, why am I, you know, why are we going to be your preferred option? And we listened to every single thing they said. Didn't matter how mad it was. You know, we had, and, and Scalzi will tell you the story, we've got guys who come in here and they tell us what bloody dingo trap you can use on your farm. And you know what? Might sound mad, but at the end of the day, that's what the customer wants. That's what that person who's going to pay your bill wants. So you've got two choices. You're going to say, no thanks, walk on, find somebody else, or you can adapt and you can give them what they want. And the chances are if you're giving someone what they want, they're going to pay you for it. So then the other thing we, uh, we had to do was we had to become efficient because every business must be efficient. There's no room for anybody, no matter how good your business is, no matter how unique your product is, you can't be inefficient. You can't have waste. You can't have... Uh, you can't have things that are dragging your customers backwards and forcing your customer to pay a price that isn't realistic in the world. So we did that. We drove through our whole business. We took out cost. We, you know, we, we managed inventories. We managed pipelines. We, we did a huge amount of work for our customers so that they could be profitable. And through them being profitable, they could afford to pay us what we needed. From us being profitable, we could afford to pay our suppliers what they needed. And that's ultimately how you participate in a value chain. You have some relevance, you understand what people need, and you, you've also got to have a bit of give and take. Because the fact is, you don't get to have the dice falling your way all the time. Sometimes you just got to cop it on the chin and go, you know what, I could have done a better deal somewhere else but we didn't. We supported that customer and we supported that supplier and we, we supported and we, we kept hold of that value chain that had been created. Because once they're created, they're actually pretty easy to break. They're, they're pretty easy for them to fall apart. So we protected that and through that, if, if eventually what happened was, instead of one farmer there became two and instead of two there became four and it gradually built and built and built and I think Goalie's now got about 50 guys who are uh, in a regular supply chain. We've gone from having one little customer in Canada who bought lasagna, who doesn't sell la lasagnas anymore, but uh, they, uh, you know, we built that supply and we took it to customers and they've taken it to their customers and they've developed it and what we've created is relevance, and I think, Gawley, it's, uh, it's probably a fair statement that in the uh, uh, seven or eight years that Al and Gawley have been uh, buying and processing and selling cattle, they've never put the price down. The price has just progressively gone up, and it's gone up, and it's gone up. And that's truly what a value chain is. It's where people understand that they're doing something that's important for someone. The customer's doing something important for, uh, for us and our producers. It's creating demand that lets them grow their businesses and develop their businesses and become profitable and build for a future. Because without that supply, those people have nothing. So, you know, I guess if it comes back and, you know, that's, that's our story, that's what we did. So then if you looked at that and you go, well, that's good, what am I going to do? So I guess... You know, if I could say, uh, if you think it's something that's relevant, and, and I think what I heard today, it's incredibly relevant. Uh, most, people, most people in agriculture participate in the commodity. And it's a very, 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 uh, what's the word? It's a difficult place to, to be. You've got the tide coming in, doesn't matter how hard you swim, what you do, you know what, you go on that way. When the tide's going out, it just takes you with you. And I think that's what happens generally with the commodity, and that's certainly what's been happening with our beef industry in the last number of years. The tide's been going the wrong way. We've been swimming like the bejesus, and we're all buggered. And, and I think, as Tim said, the tide's about to turn, and it's going to carry us. So you can either just go with the tide and not worry about it, but what's going to happen, it's going to turn again. And, and the commodity world isn't going to be any different. It's going to be as brutal. Uh, and hard 
And while we're facing a world who has got absolutely unbelievable demand for the product that's been produced, I think the people who have the luxury of identifying what their value chain is and participating in it will probably be protected through the bad a little bit more than those who, uh, who aren't. So I guess for you guys, it's about looking at your business, looking at what you do, looking at what your unique proposition is that you've got on your, uh, in your enterprise, because everyone's got something, and identifying what that gap is that uh, exists out there and how you can take what you've got and, uh, and go and, and, and find it. And then you've got to learn whatever that gap is, you've got to learn everything about it. You don't do that at home, you don't do that fixing a trough or marking a calf, you do it by getting out seeing what's going on in the world, seeing what's happening with the customers, seeing what's... talking to people, understanding what's happening, talking to the bloke next door, sharing everything you've got. At the end of the day, I think what was said in that, uh, in that uh, meeting today was uh, spot on the money. You got all the answers. You guys have got all the answers. But when you sit there and nobody plays their card and all they talk about is, yeah, did you get some rain? Yeah, you got some rain. Bloody kangaroos. Talk about what's going on in business. You know, I, I go and... I'll go out for dinner with a client and I'll say, how are you going? How's, how, how's business? You making money? Yeah, yeah, I'm making money. What was your returns? What are you getting on this? What's your GP on this? You know, what's your day to days on that? What's happening here? What's that cost you to run? What do your people cost? How do you manage the sales staff? You know, when you've got reps on the road, how do you handle them? What do you do? Find out what's going on. Learn. Everybody, everybody's got so much information. Just learn what's going on and from that, you're then going to build up your knowledge. And once you've got your knowledge, you can then take that knowledge and build it into your capability so that you can actually deliver to somebody what they need in that value chain. Then you've also got to understand where you sit in that and what your appropriate reward is for that part of that chain. And you've got to demand that reward. Not just sit back and cop what comes, not send your cattle into the market and cross your fingers, hope it's going to work. You know, at the end of the day, calf gets born, you've got a pretty good idea when you're going to take that to market. So I would be finding out who is my strategic partner that I'm going to be involved with. Might be T's at Rocky. You know, you tell them, I'm going to have 300 cattle coming out and they're going to be ready in probably somewhere between 15 and 18 months. You know, we're talking about you can't book cattle in in three months. You guys should know when they are. And, and, and create some relevance, create, and, and whether they're the right people or they're not the right people, that, to me, is about how you participate in a value chain. And I think that uh, those couple of things will apply to everybody's business, whether you're growing wool or you're growing sheep or you, you know, you meat sheep or you've got cattle or you're selling cattle into a feedlot or you've got the luxury of being able to be in an area where you can grow organic cattle or you can't and you can be PCAS or you can't and you're in ticky country and you've got to be, you know, whatever it is, find out who the best in that industry is and align yourself with them and build yourself into a value chain where you're providing something for them that's going to matter. I think the other thing I guess I'd just like to finish with is that uh, you've got to be relevant You've got to stay relevant and you've got to keep changing. Anybody who sits still, uh, the world's just going to pass you by. And I think looking at everybody here tonight and the, uh, you know, the desire that people have got to uh, embrace the future that's coming, as, every, you know, as all the people who talk about what's happening in the market have told you, it's, uh, it's on its way. You know, the world's got hungry. I just, I just probably want to... Sorry if I'm rambling, but I just want to tell you a story about uh, I was in China a couple of times last year and we went up there and when we first went to China, we, uh, you know, we sold tripe up there. You know, when I started working, we used to sell tripe up there for 40 cents a kilo. And uh, it was instead of, you know, turning it into meat and bone meal. We're now selling tripe up there for about three bucks a kilo. And that's because people got rich. People have got money. So what we used to throw out, and then we found out we could find somebody who'd pay 40 cents a kilo for it, they're now paying $3 for it, and they can't get enough of it. We went up to China, and we used to f you know, deal with a few people in Hong Kong, and then we found out, now we can deal with a few people in Shanghai, and then we can deal with a few people in Beijing, and we progressively chased further and further and further and further 
down the business chain. And we ended up coming up with most of our customers were actually people who used to have abattoirs and they used to have meat businesses. And I was uh, talking to one of them and I said, look, you know, what's, what's going on? You guys, you got an abattoir sitting here and it's empty and you're buying all this meat from me. What's happened? I said, you know, I remember 10 years ago I used to try and sell meat to the Middle East and I couldn't because, you know, the Chinese beef was in there and it was undercutting Australia and we couldn't compete. What's happened? So he said, well, 10 years ago we were exporting about 60% of our beef and we used to give it away to all the poor parts in Africa and the Middle East and uh, we didn't want it, didn't need it. Used to get subsidies to get rid of it. And about four or five years ago we sort of started not exporting anymore and we were eating it all. Then about three years ago, we were uh, starting to find it pretty hard to get numbers. And then about a year ago, we looked around and we suddenly re realised that we were running at about 10% capacity. Then we thought we'd just go a bit further afield. And these people were in Beijing. I said, so where are you getting your cattle now? And they said, um, Jesus, I don't know what it was even bloody called. Uzbekistan or so. Anyway, it was like four and a half thousand kilometres west that they were dragging cattle to kill. And the fact is, the world has depleted itself of cattle uh, and beef just got very sexy globally. People want to eat it and they're happy to pay a lot of money to eat it. And so I think that uh, what that tells us is what we've got is a pretty precious resource. And I think the other thing that's very important that people should just probably remember, the l currently the least economically viable use of agricultural land on the planet is growing cattle. So that's kind of one of two things. It really says no one's gonna convert something else into cattle country, so we're not gonna get more cattle country. But it also tells you that uh, it's all blue sky. Things are getting better and prices are going higher. But um, anyway, that's, that's my story. That's how you participate in the value chain. So I hope that uh, in some way that's um, relevant or useful to all of you and I hope that, uh, hope that it rains. Uh, and I hope you all make some money. And I hope that uh, if there are any of you out there who feel there is something that uh, what we're doing might be relevant to what you guys are doing and you'd like to talk to any of us here, uh, we'd love that opportunity. But, uh, you know, we're fans, of, uh, we're fans of this area and we're fans of the potential that it's got and we're fans of the, uh, uh, the future of where the industry is going to be. So uh, thanks very much for listening. People can create real opportunities for each other and I implore you to join AgriHive as a platform to be able to explore those opportunities and to build resilience in our rural regions.